Hello, my name is Lisa Shea, and this video series is about all things horror, horror stories, horror short stories, horror novels, horror authors, and so on. And in this particular case, we're going to be talking about one of my favorite horror stories, which is The Cask of Amontillado by Edgar Allan Poe, which was published back in 1847. I happen to also run a wine site, wineintro.com, so the idea of writing a whole horror story about Amontillado was gratefully gleeful to me, and I love Sherry, and I love Amontillado, so it makes it extra special, which is part of, you know, undoubtedly why this was a popular story, because it talked about all sorts of wine stuff, it talked about international travel, and all sorts of different interesting things that appealed to people. So this story is written in first person. Uh, you, you can find the story all over the web if you want to read it yourself because it's long out of copyright. So uh, it's written in first person. It's all from the I, I, I point of view. And this person is giving the details of an adventure that they had with a person known as Fortunato, who we get a sense that both of these are middle-aged men. And Fortunato apparently has annoyed this main character to no end. He's had a thousand injuries, and he doesn't mean like he's been stabbed by him. He means that just Fortunato was harassing him all the time, belittling him, all that kind of stuff. And the main character bo bored as best he could, but when Fortunato finally started just actually insulting him, the main character said, I've had enough. But he didn't say that to Fortunato. He just smiled like he always did and made it seem like he was still going to be the butt of the jokes going forward. But he sat there plotting his revenge, and there were two important requirements for the main character about how he's going to re revenge. First, that he had to really <laughs> go over the top with re his revenge and make sure that all of the wrongs were finally taken care of. And a second one is that he wanted to make sure that he wasn't caught at it, that if he was caught, then the whole purpose of the revenge would be undone. And also, he wanted to make sure that the person who, Fortunato in this case, who was uh, getting revenged on, knew that it was him. So it wouldn't be good enough if Fortunato just lost all his money and was miserable. He had to know it, that it was this main character who did it to him. So he sat there plotting and plotting and smiling to Fortunato and dealing with all of the insults and other nasty things that Fortunato was doing to him. But all the time he was plotting how he was really going to make this guy pay. So the one thing, or a main thing, that Fortunato had uh, as a weak point, besides being a nasty bully, was that he loved wine. And the thing says that he was a quack, a uh, uh, faker, in other types of areas like uh, old paintings and gemstones. But in the muddle of old wines, he really did know his stuff. He was good about knowing the different areas of old wines. And this was something that the main character also cared about. So it was an area that they had a combined interest and he, the main character thought this, he could use this as part of his revenge. So he made his plans. He went out and told all of his household that they had to stay home, which he knew that <laughs> he does a lot of reverse psychology in this whole story. He knew that by telling his household, his servants and such, that they had to stay home during the night of carnival, that the moment he left, that they would all go scattering like uh, cockroaches. <laughs> I suppose I'll say. So he's got the household completely empty and he goes out during carnival, which is a big party, and uh, finds his friend. And his friend, in fact, has been drinking all night, has been wearing the whole striped dress kind of foolish outfit. So uh, he's the, the Fortunato is uh, not at his full mental strength here to be able to understand what's going on. So the main character says, oh, I'm so glad I happened to find you. Oh, it's wonderful. I found, I've got a pipe, and, and when they say pipe in these situations, they mean a barrel. It's what they call the barrel. So I've got a barrel of Amontillado, and I want you to come take a look at it. Uh, Amontillado is a type of sherry, which is a type of uh, fortified wine. And in particular, Amontillado is a sherry that's made in Spain in a particular region, and it has particular flavors. So it's a, a very nice kind of sherry. And like I said, I really happen to like it. This is a Zuzu who's decided she's going to come join us. Yes, yes, stretch right in front of the camera. You are such a good kitten. Are you just gonna come looping around back and forth? Yes. Yes, there should be a horror story, as undoubtedly there are about cats, but this one is about wine and sherry, sweetie. So, yep, lay down right there. Put your head on my arm. Yep, all right, so now my left arm is trapped because I am a pillow for the cat. Back to Fortunato. 
So our main character says, I've got this barrel of Amontillado, but I'm not sure if it's really Amontillado. It could be something cheaper. And the Fortunato goes, what? You got a whole pipe of Amontillado? Again, means a barrel. You got a whole barrel of Amontillado right in the middle of this giant party season? How'd you get your hands on it? And the main character says, oh, I have my doubts and I paid the full price and I should have consulted you, I know, but it was seemed like such a bargain, I thought I should buy it. And so they go back and forth. Really? You have Amontillado? Well, I'm not sure. If you're busy, I'll go talk to Lutresi. And he says, no, no, Lutresi can't tell the difference between Amontillado from Sherry. Now, Amontillado is a Sherry, but I think what they're saying is that you can't tell a high-end Amontillado wine from cheap plonk Sherry. So... The main character keeps saying, no, I won't impose on you. No, I know you're busy. So it's the whole, again, reverse psychology stuff going on. He, the more he says, no, no, you must be busy. Oh, I'll well, go we'll just talk to Lutresi instead. The more the uh, Fortunato says, no, no, I want to come see this Amontillado. I love Amontillado. I want to get my hands on it. And I want to come feel like I am uh, helping you because I feel like I'm so much better than you, in essence. So uh, the main character says, oh, but you're sick. You have this cold. And he said, oh, no, the cold is nothing. Let me come help. And Lutrezzi can't tell the difference from Sherry and Amatellado. So we have to keep in mind that Fortunato is drunk. <laughs> so he's just running around in circles, but he's feeling very boisterous and like he wants to be the master in charge here. So together, they head back to the house to go look at this pipe of Amatellado. So again, here we talk about how there's no attendance at home and that the main character told them that he wasn't going to be back until the morning and they should not leave the house <laughs> And of course, they all immediately left the minute that he uh, left. So if he had uh, not said that, they might have come and gone. But when he made it clear that he didn't want them to leave on a party night, even though he wasn't going to be there, they all uh, got uppity and <laughs> saw their opportunity to go have fun and took off. So again, he's using a lot of reverse psychology. So he grabs some uh, torches. They head down into the vaults. A lot of the houses in this area had a deep wine cellars underneath them. They were cooler, so they would naturally keep the wine cool and it helped the wine last longer. So they get down there into the catacombs and his friend is walking in steadily because he's drunk. And uh, they're looking around in the catacombs and the friend starts coughing. And so uh, the main character says, well, here, I'll give you some Medoc, which is a uh, French wine. And, and he just, it says knocks the neck off the bottle. What it means is a bottle has a glass top with a cork. Instead of going through the effort of finding a corkscrew and pulling the cork and everything, he just whapped the top of the bottle against a brick or stone or something and broke the top of the bottle. So now, you know, I don't recommend doing this at home because now you've got shards of glass up there. But he was able to somehow uh, get a drink out of it without impaling his mouth. And I think these kinds of details are adding to the horror feel of it. So you've got a shattered top glass bottle that you're drinking red wine out of. You've got mold on the walls and, you know, um, cobwebs and all that kind of stuff down here. It's very dusty. The poor guy is sick and is coughing his full head off. But as much as the main character keeps saying, well, you're sick, you're coughing, you should go back. Now they're already down there and the uh, Fortunato knows that the Amontillado was within reach and he's just going to plow for it because he's already committed himself. So they drink the Medoc, they talk about to your long life. This uh, amuses the main character to no end because he knows that Fortunato is going to have a very short life. And so they decide to head in further to go find it. So they're talking about how now they're below the river's bed because, you know, these catacombs run for, in some cases, miles and miles and connect with other catacombs and so on. So there's an actual river up above them that was right next to the house and they are down under the river. So there's drops of moisture trickling through. There's the bones from the ancestors of this family and they keep going forward. They're drinking more Medoc out of the broken top bottle. They now get to a bottle of de Grave and they're drinking that. So, so this guy was drunk already and they're drinking even more. So um, the Fortunato flashes a sign and it's the sign of being a Mason. And the Masons are a secretive organization that we could do entire talks about what the Masons are about. But it's a 
again, another aspect of everything being mysterious and haunted. And a lot of horror stories involve masons or Templars or all those kinds of organizations. So it's just adding yet another layer of mysterious and unknown into here. So he's giving the sign of a mason. And the main character says, well, I'm a mason too, and pulls out a trowel. He's being more literal. I can <laughs> seal up walls, which is what masons did. Well, you know, the actual masons, not the, um, not the brotherhood of masons in the modern sense. So <laughs> back to the Amontillado. They decide to keep going on. They go deeper and deeper. They're going through arches. They're going uh, into a area where the air is super dense because now there's like not a lot of air movement and breezes going through here. So the torches that they've got are having problems dealing with this lack of oxygen down here. And they finally get to the very end of the crypt. Kitty, I don't want you eating things. No, don't eat that, please. You're a very good kitty. Yes. All right, so they get down to the very end of the catacombs. And they find that there's bunches of bones down there because that's the ancestors that they put down there. And that this isn't a particular room that's down here at the end. It's just a spot where you know the arches are and there's a space in there. So it, it's sort of like, we'll call it a closet. It, there's a little closet space that wasn't some sort of a special tomb or anything like that, but it just happened to be because of the way that the area was formed. So Fortunato is still obsessed with finding this barrel of Amontillado. So he's holding his torch around, looking around. He cannot see any um, barrel. So the main character says, proceed. Kieran is the Amontillado. As for Lutrece, and as immediately the friend is like distracted again. Oh, he's an ignoramus and he's going forward because he doesn't want to lose his chance of getting his hands on the Amontillado and having some other shyster come in and get his hands on it instead. So he goes in, uh, Fortunato goes in to look for this barrel. The main character goes in and quickly um, clamps him to the wall. It says that there are two iron, they say staples. I mean, in essence, what they're meaning is that they're these arm clampy things. So he puts the arm clampy things on him and secures him. And he has the key for it that he's locked it with. And the guy is drunk and he's confused. Why is he being clamped? He came down here to get some Amontillado out of him. So uh, the main character says, oh, look, it's very damp down here. Oh, should I, should I have you return? No, then I'll leave you. So at this point, he's doing his reverse psychology again. And in the past, the Fortunato was saying, no, no, I want to go forward. But now uh, the main character is saying, do you want to return? But not even letting him answer and just uh, taking his previous kitten, <laughs> taking his previous repeated denials for granted now. And the friend is still not quite sure what's going on because he's drunk and he says, well, how about the Amontillado? And the main character says, true, the Amontillado. And he's just saying, there is no Amontillado. Ha ha, you are fooled. <laughs> now you're going to have to come to accept it. So then the main character gets up his stone and mortar, which he had laid aside. So stones are, you know, they, when you've seen stone walls, they put stones in there and mortar is the gooey stuff that they lock them in place with. So he sat there and started from the first tier, the first row of stones. So he's putting stone, little mortar, stone, little mortar, and then putting a row of mortar on the top of it. And then the next row. So he's walling the guy up inside this place where he's trapped with his hands locked up. So as he's walling it up, he starts hearing these um, moans and then clankings as the guy's trying to get loose from the arm things. And he, so he's going, the main character is going up the fifth tier, the sixth tier, seventh tier. So he's building this wall to block the guy in. So now he's up to breast level with where he's made the wall. And now the Fortunato who's trapped in there starts screaming as loud as he can. And uh, at first, the main character is a little off-put by the screaming, but then when he feels comfortable that, well, no one can hear this screaming, he actually starts yelling back, and he starts yelling even louder because it's making him happy. It's proving to him, the main character, that there's no way as much yelling as this uh, Fortunato does, there's no way anyone's going to hear it, and he could just yell himself silly. So they sit there screaming together for a period of time, and filling the place with rage and, you know, in one case, 
uh, fear and panic on Fortunato's part and victory and triumph on the main character's part. part. So it's past midnight. Uh, the main character goes up the 8th, ninth, 10th tier. So he's getting up to the very top of the ceiling and he's got the last and the 11th and there's only one stone left. So he's made a whole wall of stone and mortar and there's just one hole left to put the last stone in. So he's struggling because it's heavy and it's high. And as he starts to put it in, he gets a um, crazed laugh. So at this point, Fortunato has been driven insane by the knowledge that he's been, excuse me, chained to the wall and is being walled in and he's going to die in here. So now he's going the ha ha ha, he he he, a very good joke. So his mind's getting unhinged now after all the screaming and yelling. He isn't still quite getting the sense of it. He's saying, oh, this must be a joke. Oh, we're going to have a Montillado. And the main character says, he, 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 yes, the Amontillado. And um, let us be gone. Let us be gone. And then the uh, Fortunato says, for the love of God, Montresor. And we finally <laughs> get someone referring to him directly by his name. And Montresor says, yes, for the love of God. But, you know, the, the Fortunato is pleading, please let me out. And the other guy is saying, with all that you've done to me, then this is what you deserve. And I am quite set at what I'm going to do. So then there was no response at all. The main character is a little annoyed because he wants this guy to be tortured for a long, long time. But there's no answer. Uh, he sticks the torch in through the hole and lets it fall in there. But there's only the jingling of the bells, which could have been called, caused by the torch falling and hitting the bell, balls. And it says, my heart grew sick. It was the dampness of the catacombs that made it so. So what we're saying is now the main character is unhappy because part of his whole purpose in doing this was to torture the character for a long time. But, you know, there was a period where the guy was screaming for help, which made him very happy. And then he sort of pushed him into madness, which made him happy. But that was a very reasonably short period of time compared to all the time that the guy was being um, tortured and humiliated himself. So the thought that now he was just going to be passed out and insensible uh, takes away the fun of the revenge for him. So now he hastens to make the end of his labor. He's, he's going quickly to get the wall finished. Puts the last stone in position. He plasters it up. He puts all the bones back so it all looks normal. And the story is over. So he leaves the guy in there. So he was really gleeful the entire time that he was bringing the guy down there, plotting how much the guy would suffer and how he would be down there screaming for weeks until he uh, you know, died from lack of food and lack of water and so on. Uh, but his revenge sort of fell flat because the guy, while he had a short period of terror and madness, very quickly then went insensible or maybe passed out or something like that. So uh, it... It didn't give him quite the satisfaction that he wanted to get out of it. But a number of key reasons why this was a well-done horror story is the whole atmosphere of it. The atmosphere of someone who you trust and is a friend, having all these devious designs behind that smiling face and plotting your complete destruction. Um, the idea that he wasn't being open about it the entire time. He's saying, oh, no, you don't need to come with me to try the Amatillado. Oh, I'll go talk to Lutresi instead. Oh, no, you you must be busy. So all of those things made the Fortunato character actively go, want to go with them. So Fortunato at any time could have said, oh, no, you're right. I, I'd rather hang out and play at the carnival or I'd rather do something else. But it was Fortunato's own fault, in a way, for continually saying, no, no, I do want to go with you. Oh, I do want to come down into the caves. Oh, I'm really coughing a lot, but that's okay. I, I will keep going. So and part of it is that he uh, went of his own accord. But part of it is that uh, the main character was being so devious and tricky in the way that he was phrasing everything that he was luring the guy into doing it. He was taking advantage of his uh, character. And again, he did that with the servants, too, where he told the servants uh, that he was not going to be home until morning and definitely do not leave the house, which then <laughs> caused them all to promptly leave the house and go uh, off to do their uh, partying for the night. So other than that, a lot of it is the uh, 
the spider webs down in the crypts. The crypts are damp. He uses all sorts of senses. The way the crypts smell, they smell nasty. The air is dense. There's all sorts of grimy stuff down there. The mold is down there. And then just this incessant uh, sense of he's being friendly and nice, but there's this evil sliminess under him that the entire time he's plotting to torture and kill him. And the, maybe that the guy hadn't quite been so drunk, he would have seen it, but also maybe he just wouldn't have because he's thought of this person as an unworthy underling that he could bully for all these years and years, we have to assume, that he just assumes there's no way that he's going to actually do anything about it. So other than that, let me know if you have any questions about it. You should get yourself a bottle of Amontillado. <laughs> and drink it while you read this story. Um, since I do like wine, I, I suppose I could have had a glass of Amontillado while I read this. I could, do that. I could actually read the story at some point while I am drinking Amontillado. All right, ask if you have any questions. Please like and subscribe to the channel and let me know uh, if you want any particular stories covered in the future. Thank you very much. <laughs>